Wedgeside Podcast is a proud member of the Wedgeside Media Collective. This week's episode is brought to you by the Wedgeside Media Collective store. This is your last week to pick up those vegan thank you totes for the low price of $7.50. So check those out. They're available in three different ink colors. So go to witchsidecollective.org and pick them up. Get them while they're hot and cheap. This is episode 199. Yeah, we talk with Layla Abdel Rahim. You know, we've talked to a lot of anti civ people, and this has been my favorite conversation so far. Um, I really like her perspective on, on everything and really like talking with her. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with her, I'm, but I, I love the idea. Maybe I romanticize the idea of primitivism a little too much, but. Uh, I really like this conversation. I think it's 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 fantastic. Uh, so stick around through it. Uh, I hope you enjoy it as well. Hey Jordan, what news invest do we have going on this week? If you're in Denver on September second, there's solidarity with Lex at the Lindsay Flanagan Courthouse. Um, no new animal labs starts their European speaking tour on September second through the twenty first. On September eighth, Daniel McGowan will be speaking at Burning Books in Buffalo, New York. And on September 9th is the National Prison Strike. And if you're here in Salt Lake City on September 10th, be sure to check out the Salt Lake City Veg Fest. We'll be there. So come say hi. Yeah, we're going to be in a booth with uh, Vegan Warrior Princesses Attack. I mean, we all know that's who you really want to talk to. That's who I want to talk to. So it'll be fun hanging out with them. So come come drop by. Say hi. We'll have uh, some swag for sale. Is it swag if it's for sale? I guess not. We'll have stuff for stuff sale. Stuff we all get. Yeah. There you go. Come on down. This week's listener shout out comes from David Watts. David just wanted to say, just for people to critically think slash join up the dots concerning the pervasiveness of domination and its possible roots. It's a pretty good shout out, especially for this episode. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, David. Uh, is it that time of the, the week? The Wapow? Yeah. I think it is cool so uh for the slingshot this week on the 3rd of september in 1860 a u.s citizen by the name of william walker invaded honduras with his own fucking private army he's like the blackwater of 1860 hmm. yeah fucking crazy if you like these little tidbits of history Pull them out of the Slingshot Personal Organizer. You can uh, get one and keep yourself organized and get these fantastic facts. As well as, there's a bunch of stuff in this book that's pretty amazing. Um, So, yeah, get one. Take notes in it. Keep your days organized. Learn fun, interesting facts. And uh, you can get one at a local info shop or an online info shop like AK Press. I know it sounds super addy, but they don't pay us for this. We just really like what they do. I really hope you enjoy this episode. How's your day going so far? Well, uh, it's uh, um, it's hectic. I just uh, recently got back from India, as you know, and my daughter is going off to college. And so it's uh, quite a whirlpool. <laughs> well, uh, what brought you to India? Um, well, I, uh, I participated in this um, educators uh, conference. Um, they're trying to... Uh, build new pedagogies for the future, which we can discuss later, how hopeful or hopeless (laughs) these attempts are. 
Um, and then after that, I gave, uh, I went on a public uh, lecture tour for uh, the, the Rutledge book. They're going to release it. Uh, they said they're interested in uh, releasing it in paperback. So that was uh, really great. And uh, I basically toured the whole country. So Bangalore, the mountains around Bangalore, um, uh, the, uh, in the Eastern Ghat, um, small villages, then uh, Goa, went to the jungle in Goa. Um, some of the projects where they're giving back the land to the animals, to the tigers mm -hmm. and other uh, wildlife. Um, then there was uh, Mumbai was kind of <laughs> a, a small break uh, with a friend and then the intensity started in Delhi. <laughs> Delhi, Faridabad, Hyderabad, <laughs> non-stop. <laughs> I, I've always heard Goa is just absolutely beautiful. Uh, it's always been on my to, to go uh, of places. Yeah, uh, well, the whole of India was actually quite amazing. Um, the uh, the range of experiences, the range of emotions it evokes, um, the range of uh, kindness and brutality. It's just so. It's like uh, New York tenfold mm -hmm. <laughs> and more. And um, so all of it. Uh, Goa is is special, but also. Um, I just spent a day in Goa with some friends, so, you know, they took me that around, uh, uh, they live kind of like through small villages and they're very beautiful, but mostly it was the jungle that really impressed me. Um, yeah. As I was going to say, I've always heard that, that India is that land of extremes on, on both ends and it, and, and it showcases it very well, uh, you know, you can see everything um, from both ends of the extremes, no matter what, like, section of society you're looking at. Yes, and so for me also it's very interesting because uh, both, um, uh, you know, on, an, on a personal level and, uh, well, my work is also my personal level. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's uh, I mean, I do it because I, I just, you know, crave, you know, for a more livable and um, compassionate uh, wilderness and... Uh, and then, but also, you know, it's kind of, well, on a personal level when you just want to forget about the pain and just go and lose yourself in the forest and that wilderness. Um, so it was very interesting, um, precisely because I found that in, um, in contrast, say, to the West, and I've been here for like the, the past 10 years, I decided not to take uh, planes anymore and travel by bike, train, you know, um, when necessary, take a car. Um, so I haven't left the continent for 10 years. And so kind of going back to a part of the world from which, well, I, I'm not from Asia, but, you know, it's kind of reminiscent of my experiences in Africa or say Japan or in Russia. Um, so it was still very shocking because you kind of uh, you don't notice how um, you become part of where you live and start forgetting about what the world is like elsewhere. And so it it was a very interesting reminder of what has frustrated me in that world um, and why I left here and what frustrates me here and what I crave there, but at the same time, I feel that precisely these things that frustrate me are the reason why I should stick it out and effectuate some change. Do, do, you, do you have any specific examples of how that expressed itself uh, in your travels? Um, yeah, of course. Um, so, for example, um, what frustrates me in North America is the... Um, well, the anthropocentrism, and the anthropocentrism spans even, um, I would say, even sometimes animal rights and animal liberation circles. Well, not as much because you know these people are usually more sensitive towards, uh, say, the animals. But then um, they're 
kind of very binary and still a lot of the um, of the claims or the arguments made uh, still have this anthropocentrism at its basis in the premises and unlike say my experiences in well in Africa anthropocentrism is even more well again I don't I can't speak for the whole of Africa but Northeast Africa uh, particularly Sudan um, spent some time in Ethiopia Kenya Egypt especially um, so I guess uh, uh, Sudan and Egypt probably because of Islam the anthropocentrism is really like it's also bound uh, or legitimated and uh, secured uh, by um, the religious narrative um, and so going to India this was the first thing that struck me how receptive they are uh, to the critique of anthropocentrism and to the violence against animals at the same time uh, because civilization is the oldest there you see that um, the, the human hierarchy is so much stronger that even uh, the madness that's going on around the elections in the states right now mm -hmm. pales in comparison because um, it's not stated but the, the visibility of the children on the streets of you know of the caste system that is still very much alive today um, it's so heartbreaking and so then you know you kind of well you know I, I come and I give my my critiques I give my talks and they're receptive to that you know the the compassion the ecology it's, there's a lot of initiatives going on a lot of debates really interesting and actually I would say in many cases um, in some ways perhaps more effective than here in North America um, and yet I see that they're they're stumbling against the same borders where if you don't um, combine the issues and if you don't look at the whole problem of civilization then um, we'll just be either fighting for tigers or for the indigenous tribes for the untouchables or for you know so you know for this for this or for that and so it ends up still being um, uh, this reality which we have here but only from the other angle so, Does that make a bit sense? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so, what what is your critique as far as the the steps to to fix the, those those hierarchical societies in with uh, with humans that, like you said, with the caste system, um, but not just in the caste system, but we also see going to play within capitalism in general and other institutions, but as well as the the hierarchy that we have with animals. Yeah. So um, basically, that's. Um, uh, that's the whole uh, well, crux of my work, um, the whole crux of the problem that I try to tackle in you know, my different essays, books, and um, the the basis of um, of this economic system and political system because it's all it all organizes us in relationship to each other um, in terms of uh, what. What role do you play in the production of resources, of energy, of you know, whatever? Um, and so, um, if, at, at the basis, at the core of it, it's a problem. It's an issue of um, um, the choices that we make in terms of our subsistence strategies. So that takes us back to that critique okay so uh, it manifests the, the the choices that we made or some of us our ancestors uh, made um, that created that manifest themselves in 
this system, well, you know, agricultural civilization um, that is today manifest itself in global capitalism. Um, actually, at the root of it, when you look, it's a predatory system. And this predation is a choice that was not actually, that maybe at a certain point um, in an ecological crisis, uh, scavenging for dead cadavers was a necessity and was the right choice at that time for whatever group of people that suffered and took up that strategy. But usually you see that um, most animals who have been frugivores um, or gathering fruits and the cho choosing the role as disseminators of seeds, so it's like primates and birds and, you know, uh, small mammals, most of them. So when, out of necessity, they would take this choice of carnivory or scavenging, they would revert. And you see even chimps, they would take a decision when there's encroachment from humans on their forest, um, they could wage wars, they could start hunting, but most of the time then they would revert and go back if um, the system becomes ecologically viable again, they revert back to that choice, original choice they made. And so um, at a certain point when a group of humans decided not to revert and took it a step further, that's when hunting began. And with hunting, um, in order to institutionalize it as a cultural choice, as a strategy, um, alienation became necessary and then um, technologies of this alienation and murder became necessary and the kind of they uh, this is the the choice demanded that these technologies be uh, developed and these and the development of the technologies ensured that this choice then remains and so this is um, uh, I could see it very clearly that even in India, where actually there's still uh, a lot of people who are vegetarian, uh, vegan, there are still there are hunter-gatherers who mostly gather, um, and still you see that uh, the uh, the predatory economy frames our relationships to the world to each other to other species and ensures that whatever role we take, we are still reproducing it. And so the task that I see now more clearly is that then it, if it doesn't matter whether you're vegan, vegetarian, hunter-gatherer, um, or like completely buying into this whole industrial um, predatory system, then... Um, the task is that uh, we should undo this whole knowledge on which we base our, our desires are formulated, on which our fears are rooted, and on which we base our daily, uh, maybe even unconscious decisions to participate in order not to perish. So we need to undo this whole anthropology of the human as a predator and uh, rewild both our knowledge and our relationships within our spaces. So, namely, if so far we are all stuck in anthropocentric relationships and spaces and usually catering towards this anthropocentrism and the interests of humans, how are we going to break that anthropocentrism on a larger scale through um, through the narratives that are given as um, science, as education, as fiction, as um, and then you know as um, uh, imposed uh, options on us? You know, you have an option to work here or work there. You know, do this or do that. Um, and so, 
if you have any specific uh, things you want me to illustrate this with, I'm, I'll be willing to. If you have any questions, yeah, let's um, uh, let's start with what, what is your your origin? Like, what brought you to uh, this quote unquote radical uh, thinking and uh, uh, position as far as you know viewing the hierarchical structures is concerned. <laughs> I never saw this as radical. <laughs> I was kind of always like this. <laughs> this is just normal. <laughs> um, and it's true, like, um, ever since, since I could remember myself, um, that's how I felt and I thought. I just didn't have the vocabulary. And uh, uh, if you want me to speak more about, like, my personal, like where I'm born and how I got to find the vocabulary. Yeah, yeah. How did, how did you, what, what was your <laughs> awakening into like, oh, well, this is what it's called? Because I kind of feel the same way. Like there's a, uh, I've always pretty much been like an anarchist, but I didn't, there didn't know the, the terminology, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so my, uh, my father was from Sudan and, um, his dream was to become a geologist, go to the Soviet Union, uh, study there and come back and uh, make his country independent from England and, and rich and, and, you know, equal among the nations. So Patrice Lumumba was hot at the time. Uh, there was a lot of aspirations uh, in terms of uh, leftist po politics and all that and geology. Um, was supposed to play this role in liberating and, you know, giving this wealth and, and stuff. And my mother um, is Russian. She came from a small village, a tiny village uh, in the south of Moscow region. Um, and ever since she was a kid, uh, she actually in that tiny village, 15 houses, they would walk to school um, in the next... Uh, uh, it's not even a town, it's just like a larger village. <laughs> um, that's 10 kilometers, they had to, to walk through forest, mm -hmm. um, winters, so snow, wind, rain, you know, whichever. And um, she f discovered uh, ever since she was a kid uh, that there exists a beautiful river called the Nile, and it was a white Nile, and there was the Blue Nile, and they flew together, um, they would flow to meet in Khartoum, and together they would majestically flow into the Mediterranean Sea. So she would look for the, in spring especially, she'd look for the, you know, different creeks and she'd say, oh, this is the Blue Nile, this is the, the White Nile, and they majestically flow into the Mediterranean Sea. And then, and she, the second thing she was dreaming of is becoming a Russian linguist. So she went to Moscow and at the university met my dad, whose dream came true and my mom's dream came true and um, passion and all that. And then I became, <laughs> um, um, well, I came into being and um, uh, parts of my, uh, uh, of the time, they would just send me off to my grandparents in that village. And so... Um, that was very interesting because my grandfather would show me the, would spend a lot of time uh, going into the forest and he would show me how life is born in the forest and how peaceful and, and um, wise and just and moral the wilderness is. And um, the, the German army during, the, uh, during World War II actually when they were coming to Moscow, were stopped just across that forest. And so he would show me the places with burned, or, you know, destroyed uh, villages. He would mention, like, you know, here and here, so, so many people perished. And basically um, that humans, when they come into the forest, they, they bring death and destruction. And so it was very interesting that at the same time they were farmers and they had animals. And the animals had names and they would say, I love you and would call them names. And, and then, um, oops, and one of the animals would get into a soup. 
And I did not start speaking until the age of four. So it was before I was four. I realized that there was this deep hypocrisy, like the, this understanding and this love of the forest. And at the same time, you bring these animals in, you domesticate them. Well, again, I didn't have that vocabulary, but you know, I could see, well, they're keeping them. They're, they're saying, I love you. And then the next day the animal could be eaten. And actually I was terrified after that. Whenever anyone said, I love you, I thought, oh my God, when are they going to eat me? <laughs> <laughs> and so <laughs> this identification with the animals and then running off into the woods or into the, there's the there was the kalhos, which is, um, um, how you call it, the, the communal, uh, the, the, the the state um, uh, agricultural land, which, you know, the villagers would, you know, uh, plow for the state, but then everyone had their own little kind of fa tiny farm. And so uh, running off into the sunflower fields uh, and just staying there again, you know, with the mice, with the birds, um, it, it was before I... I could speak. I already knew that it was wrong. Like I, I could not hurt them. I should not eat them. Uh, my place is not to say I love you and then destroy you. Um, I didn't want it for myself, and so I knew they did not want that for them. And there was a big difference. I knew there was a big difference between the wolf hunting and the humans hunting, and. As I went on, um, maybe um, later, like much later, um, studying civil engineering, I realized that, um, well, it, it, building dams and, and roads uh, was, was part of that same um, culture of, of murder of the wilderness, of destroying the wilderness. And I quit civil engineering. Um, and then after that, I became much more um, conscious about um, where the violence resided and how, like, how we should start approaching it at least. So that's that's the short. But there were many other things. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did, so, yeah. I did want to touch uh, base with some of the questions that some of our listeners had would that be okay yes of course okay so one of the questions that we got was um whether or not you believe that humans have a natural habitat as other species do so for example um would you agree that people in climates unsuitable for humans um should relocate be helped to relocate to areas which are natural human habitats such as warm climates with cool shade and clean water um, I don't believe there's anything essentialist about any group of living beings. I believe it's all cultural strategies. And um, the strategies in the wilderness usually, um, except for when we're threatened by a disease, uh, they're usually viable and sustainable. And so... Um, Humans could like could live in any climate. I mean, that's why our um, physiology um, is considered to be uh, omnivorous. It's not because like we're supposed to be predators, but it's that it gives us this uh, possibility to adapt to scavenging when it is needed and uh, to still retain that cultural choice, uh, that social contract that we have with the plants to help disseminate the seeds and propagate life. Um, so um, I don't think it's, it's an issue of where humans um, have chosen to move. Movement is the principle of life, but it's movement through chaos which means you adapt to other particles of life around you in a viable manner. You make your 
strategies according to the strategies devised by that system. If you see any one and, and all the other organisms in, in the wilderness, when they see any one group overtaking others, they curb it. They curb that group um, because they need to keep that balance. And humans are now the epidemic that, that threatens, that has not been curbed on time, and now threatens the viability of the planet. So what does that mean? Again, that doesn't mean we need to annihilate humans. That doesn't mean we need to ship them off to um, whatever um, things we think, uh, according to whatever narrative we heard that they should reside in. Um, we should find a healthy way to rewild ourselves within the places in which we find ourselves now, which means that we start giving back those spaces to diversity of life and seeding uh, the place we have kind of conquered for ourselves as you know the crown of evolution. We are not. Uh, we have not been created by God to, to rule over the, uh, the animal kingdom, and we have not evolved to be the ultimate predator to devour the animal kingdom. Um, if you, it's possible to revert. It's possible to make new strategies. Evolution is all about making new strategies, adapting, changing. It's all possible, but we have to do it where we are, as we are, and rewilding those spaces, giving back to the wilderness on the terms of that wilderness, not on our terms. So it won't work, like degrowth doesn't work. Um, you know, taking the, the carer of the forest concept doesn't work. Um, we really need to rewild those spaces and letting the animals take over and us listening through empathy, adapting, learning how to give back to the spaces we have colonized and we have been only extracting from. It's all about giving back. Mutualism. Life requires mutualism. Mutualism depends on giving back to the community from which you took in whatever form, but you have to give back. We have been taking, taking, taking. And now, like, finding a different place to move to, be it uh, for, you know, the those who believe, uphold hunting, well, you know, we'll find the last remnants of the forest and kill the last, you know, running deer, um, is not a solution. Um, well, you know, bombing cities because, well, you know, cities are are not viable, and this is inadvertently, we, we're not being told this, but inadvertently this is what is being happening uh, with all those bombed cities in the Middle East. Uh, Europe has been bombed, Africa has been bombed. Um, that's not the solution. Uh, the solution is really rewilding ourselves, and you'll see that the gender aspect will immediately be fixed with this demand on reproduction of human resources, um, it will wither away immediately. There will be no need for that because we will be um, tuning into a different mode of listening to each other as humans, but also across species. So uh, a follow-up question to that would be, um so with that that rewilding, how how would you go through that kind of process without having caused uh, pretty much mass suffering among humans, or do you view that kind of critique just an anthropocentric view in of itself? Um, in in what sense? So like like, like you say, uh, like rewilding ourselves and and we'll adapt to individual to areas that we're at. We'll uh, certain areas that we're at during that rewilding phase would would you know pretty much cause a, a lot of suffering because uh, our entire civilizations are based upon uh, the current structure in place so the current habitat that we're using we wouldn't be able to normal use anymore um, so there'd be suffering there or what about 
the uh, people that need like the specialized medical care uh, that that's only available due to the specialization um, of of those areas. So that mm -hmm. type of that type of aspect. So, okay, well, because um, that presumes already that um, we don't see the suffering that's already happening, and that um, that presumes, or maybe it's uh, the the question is spoken from the perspective of somebody who has not uh, lived. Um, through war, through total desertification, through total uh, total poverty, you know, in in Delhi, I saw um, we went to Faridabad, um, ended up coming back late, so I saw Delhi like after midnight, and it was heartbreaking to see the kids choosing to sleep in the lane between the, the, you know, on the divide between the um, opposite lanes of the highway because there's lamps, so they, they're they naked, sleeping, so they wouldn't be raped. And you see the, the you know, there's a kid, then another kid, a dog, um, another animal, uh, somebody else could, could be an adult but too skinny, and they're, like, it's very hot, the cars are honking and driving like crazy on bo on both sides, opposite directions, and in between, these people are sleeping because there is nothing else in their world to protect them, to give them food, shelter, clothing. Um, so to say that it, you know, rewilding will cause suffering ignores the fact that there is so much suffering in civilization and this is again if we're anthropocentric and we care about humans okay here like human children what about the animals what about that rhino the last rhino walking knowing that there is no future no one to give his culture to his strategy his peaceful viable beautiful culture that has helped life be for millions of years and he is the last one to walk the earth and die okay if if somebody like if if you have this understanding and this feeling you would never be able to say that well the you your demanding of uh, rewilding will cause people to suffer it will cause people Maybe it will cause people to suffer who have huge houses and they don't want to give those houses up or they have access to medical care. But we have a, a neighbor's father from Pakistan died um, just before I came back from India because he, he had medical care. He went to the hospital. Even my daughter, when she was 10, she already knew the symptoms for a heart attack. Um, he goes to the hospital with all the symptoms of a heart attack and they give him aspirin because they don't care. And the guy died and he could have been saved. Had they interfered then, he, ca he comes back two or three days later and he dies. But he could have been saved. He went to the hospital. So the hospitals are not there to take care of humanity as such. Um, education is not there to take of care of humanity. Businesses are not there to take care of humanity. Agricultural farmers are not there to take care of humanity. Uh, we are all forced into these um, options to cater for a specific, that, that's what domestication is, for a specific agent of our will, the one who will reward us if we do what he, and I use it intentionally, chooses for us to do. Um, this is what civilization is about. And rewilding would allow precisely the safety in the spaces. You rewild a city space, even cities can be sustainable. They're not sustainable, not because the place itself is not sustainable. They're not sustainable because the culture of predation is not meant to be sustainable.
It's not meant to reward the prey. It's meant to consume the prey. And it depends on which part of that hierarchy you find yourself. If you find yourself as a poor white man, um, abused by the system, still you have white women below you, you can prey on. Um, you have people of color and then the animals and, and the land and everything else. Um, it's not like, again, an intentional kind of meanness with which we make these choices. A lot of the times we, do, we don't see other options, but it's because we don't see that we could win more if we decide to just say no to those options and rewild our possibilities, our cultures and our spaces, rather than giving into that pressure and whining, well, you know, I'm not talking about the person who asked the question, it's more, you know, more general, but um, a lot of the time people just whine and complain about I'm not happy at work, I, don't, I hate what I do, da 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 da. Uh, but what, what will I do? How will I feed my family? How, how will I pay my rent? How will I do this? How will I do that? And um, unless you are, you really find meaning, total meaning, for your, you know, in what you do. Maybe it's worth stepping back and doing it differently. And by doing it differently, you'll see that actually you'll be giving more to your community and your community will be much richer because it won't be only, again, you know, single species or single class or single gender or single race. Um, it will be much richer and much safer in that. A, another uh, listener question that we had was, um, what is your solution to the nuclear waste problem, uh, specifically because of the long half-life and toxicity level that it has and where we might need that specialization for a long time to make sure that it doesn't cause uh, continuous harm to the environment and, and, and all living creatures around the planet for thousands of years yeah that that question that i agree is um a serious problem and that's a trap that um uh in 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 which it, it's not an easy um answer and it's not an easy solution because uh we kind of trapped um and you see that for example uh, even in the logic of, um, um, of the superpowers, um, it works. Uh, that if, if if one superpower uh, knows that there is another superpower that has uh, nuclear weapons, um, they will not maybe they will not go rampant. You know, that's one of the, um, I, I mean, it's, it's not my argument, but it's one of the kind of explanations mm -hmm. of uh, how you keep the balance of power. Um, and then there's the daily nuclear energy, of course. And there's a lot of, um, well, there's a lot of ra radiation in, in everything, in, in, in the technology that we use for communication, technology for, again, medical facilities. Um, yeah, um, we're there. Um, I don't believe that um, since we're there, it does not mean that that's it. We can't go back. It's kind of the ultimate, because, you know, one of the evolutionary um, arguments that we cannot revert to, say, frugivory and gathering and... Uh, is that, uh, well, you know, we've evolved to become this, okay? And then, of course, it doesn't hold because, well, evolution entails change, so, you know, th there's no reason for you not to change. Um, nuclear argument is a much more difficult argument because it's from, it's outside of us. It's, it's a choice we imposed on ourselves and became submitted to that choice. Um, 
we we need to go with that choice in the sense that well we'll we'll, we'll need to maintain some of those uh, we'll need to find ways how to uh, shut the plants uh, shut the technologies um, but at the same time obviously there has to be um, and what would be the word maybe um, an attack on the system um, on the epistemology um, from a different angle where the maintenance of these nuclear plants will not be um, a justification for the current status quo and rather that okay this is the result of the ill decisions that we have taken but we have reverted and we have rewilded and we shall dismantle this disease as soon as we can so it's still not an excuse not to do all the other work just because we have made this crazy fatal decision um another another one was somebody wanted your opinion um about this quote from animal liberation front prisoner walter bond he mm -hmm. said I feel that technology. I feel that the technology problem is the source of animal and earth degradation. If there was no industry and computer tech, even if everyone hunted and ate animals, ninety-nine percent of the animal abuse and murder that exists today would be gone. Okay. Once again, um, he said, "I feel that the technology problem is the source of animal and earth degradation." If there Degradation. Was no, uh -huh. Uh -huh. If there was no industry and computer tech, even if everyone hunted and ate animals, 99% of animal abuse and murder that exists today would be gone. Okay, well, <laughs> I disagree with that. And actually, I discussed it. Uh, the, the first chapter of my uh, children's literature, Domestication and Social Foundation, the Rutledge book, uh, it's available on, for free online and play Google. Um, I talk precisely, um, uh, my research brought me to realize that uh, the problem, uh, all the problems, economic and speciesist and sexist, um, misogynist, wars, everything is actually go goes back to that decision to hunt. And so, yes, like when you look at um, pre-industrial so human societies that hunted, and again, not all those all of those societies hunted, um, but those that hunted, yes, the um, the effect was not visible right there. However, it was that decision to hunt and kill that developed that required the development of the technologies of murder and of predation and of alienation and so if it required those technologies the technologies then ensured that that choice becomes permanent and because it's not sustainable you you always have to kill more it's like agriculture you know you colonize it colonization and expansion is built within its unviability within its um, basic foundation. Um, the more you practice, the more you destroy, the more you require to acquire and to dominate and colonize. It's exactly the same with the nuclear uh, technology question. It brings us to a point where the more you develop it, the less chances you have of coming out of it. And again, it does, um, it does not mean we cannot come out of it, but it is necessary. And yes, I know there's um, a lot of debate. Um, people say, well, you know, uh, indigenous people 
pe people is hunted. And so uh, when you talk about, like when you critique hunting, uh, you're basically, it's an attack on indigenous people. And today, it's not the indigenous people who are hunting or when they hunt, uh, they are still within the hierarchy of predation. They are still the prey. Um, with very few uh, outlets for uh, participating in that predatory narrative and, and structure. Um, so if we're going to talk about the right to hunt because that was the evolutionary choice to which we have adapted and that's it, like basically we're, we can't go anywhere else, uh, we're talking about um, mostly white people. Black people are not on, on this continent are not allowed to own guns. I mean, they're not allowed to even walk on the streets. Um, so that they'll be shot. You know, the excuse is always, oh, we, th we thought he was armed, we thought she was armed, or, or whatever. Um, so it's it's not an attack on, um, on the victims in this narrative. But it is a necessary understanding that like if if we want to get out of this mess we need to understand what precipitated the situation to to this you know um to what we have today and that decision to kill and to normalize killing and to alienate ourselves from the screens and the desire to will uh, to to live of those whom we kill, that precipitates this whole predatory situation with its hierarchy, with everyone feeling that because I am being predated on, then I have no other choice or this is the normal way and I shall also predate on someone who's weaker than me. And it's both socially but also um, in terms of what we eat. Um, so that would be my response. I hope it makes sense. Yeah, it, yeah, it does. Um, a, a, another question that, that, that we got was, uh, how do you address the problem of the, the whole globe not changing at the same time? So basically having one community uh, basically rewild themselves, but how how does that stop the the rest of the globe from being already being predatory in nature from being predatory towards this new group um, to begin with yeah well i agree um that's something i i think about often um and uh, uh yeah and especially you see for example um in in some situations well in uh, historically in many situations um that the one who was colonized uh, then adapts uh, to the culture and, and strategy, subsistence strategies of the colonizer and then colonizes in turn. I mean, you can say um, when civiliza agricultural civilization became institutionalized in parts of Asia and the Middle East and when they started spreading around um, they were colonizing the peoples around, like Egypt, for example. And then Egypt responds with its own civilization and they spread to Europe. And then, you know, Southern Europe, uh, Mediterranean, they suddenly come up with civilization. Then they start spreading north. Europe gets colonized. Then those colonizers, uh, colonized people become colonizers in turn. And so now you see in Africa, um, cities like are growing like mushrooms um people are proud that they have asphalt roads high rises petroleum this and this and that um and at the same time these incredible desertification problems incredible pollution incredible um well acidification change of the of the oceans change of the environment lack of potable water um it's it's a real problem and, and so my visit to india was very interesting precisely because then uh we 
being so Eurocentric here, we don't hear about what the people, we only hear about, well, you know, they have caste system in India, the cities in Nigeria are fancier than, you know, Toronto or whatever. Um, and we don't hear about um, how resistance is still ongoing, how knowledgeable. I was so impressed in the villages in, in the Eastern Ghat in, in Kupam, um, east of Bangalore. Uh, we went to the uh, small villages, visited the teachers there. And the schools are, you know, in the, a school is just a wall. Uh, the kids sit on the floor. There's a, hardly any books. There's a, a fan, um, a blackboard. And the teachers are so knowledgeable about everything that goes on, environmental, ecological, political uh, problems, everything. The kids, we talked with the kids, the kids know what's going on in the world. The problem is that not having that um, solidarity across the different spots of the earth for people to know it's happening, it's everywhere. You're not alone. You don't have to take the choices. The kids love the villages. They know about um, the problems of colonization by the city. I, I asked them, so what does the city give? You, you grow things here. Where does it go? To the city. What does the city give you back? Well, plastic bottles, uh, pollution, bad water. But, uh, do, so do you love your... Uh, your, your place, your villages, your the, the countryside. Um, yes, we love very much. We don't want to leave, but we have to go to the city because there is no other option. And so it's this kind of um, lack of soli solidarity that allows them to give up and allows us to despair as well here. So you think, oh, well, you know, the rest of the world doesn't want, you know, everyone is like in this um, competition about who will be the ultimate predator, who will be the ultimate winner, um, who earns more per capita, et cetera, et cetera. And so it, it sounds like it's overwhelming. Um, but I believe after visiting there and, and speaking um, with the kids and especially, and the kids, in the end asked me, so, well, can, can you help us, you know, get rid of this colonization? What should we do? So, you know, and I'm like, well, you know, find your ways, find the people who will help you stay here, defend the land here, defend the forest, reforest, and, and find strength in that solidarity. I will be there. There's a lot of people out there. You can find them. You can find the, the, the blogs, you can find the groups, you can, people travel, people talk, um, but it's your work and you have to do it here. But knowing about others um, inspires that uh, we go on. For me, the, un the continuous battle that the uncontacted tribes um, have is um, is ultimately what if if these people don't give up, nobody has the right to give up. Well, I can't believe it's already been an hour. Um, what are some ways that people can find your books and find out more about your projects and contact you and get involved? Well, you can find more on my website. Um, there's everything you can. There's email. There's uh, uh, place to leave uh, comments, uh, info about my books, talks, links to different things, uh, and it's um, Leila. So L A Y L A. Dot Miltsov, M I L T S O V. Dot org. Uh, so you can find uh, more about my work there. And um, good luck at rewilding. <laughs> Stay strong <laughs> and wild. <laughs> this week you heard Stone in Kyoto by Air. 
Right now you're listening to Chillaxin by the Sea by Grammatics. Chillaxin? I want to chillax. Me too. So uh, every week we talk about uh, rate and reviewing us on iTunes. And uh, if you've done it, we want to give you a big thank you. If you haven't, I don't have a reason to thank you yet for it. But if you do it, then I'll thank you because that's how it works. Thank you in advance. Oh, I could. Yes. Thank you, kind sir. I will thank you in advance because you're going to do it because now you have a thank you and you're going to feel guilty about not doing it previously. I mean, that's, you know, I'd feel pretty guilty if somebody thanked me for doing something I didn't do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you right there. Yes, you. You are now officially thanked. And now you have to go do it. That's just that's the social contract that we have now constructed that we're not going to impose upon you to the hierarchical constraints of our society. We now have that authority we just gave you. So now you need to break those bonds and actually go write a review. We are internationally syndicated talk show hosts. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for all your interviews. The only uh, other better thing you can do is uh, just tell a friend to listen. So do that as well. Speaking about friends, you should be our friend on social media. Just go to the social media of your choice. You know, the ones that the government controls. Mind. I don't know what I was going with there. <laughs> I don't know what you're going with either. Just go to your favorite social media and be our friend. We do now have all of our episodes up on YouTube. Um, just wanted to thank Future Heart for this shout out on our episode with Anita from Toronto Pig Safe. Future Heart said, well articulated and great information. That's a, yeah, that was a pretty good one. She uh, has yeah, she, some court dates coming up, right? Yeah, for uh, giving water to a pig. Of all things. Fuck shit, damn. I don't, I don't know what else to do. Which Side Podcast is hosted and produced by Jordan Halliday and Jeremy Parkin of the Which Side Media Collective. With web design by Jordan Halliday and sound design by Jeremy Parkin. Booking by Mari Halliday. Theme music by Commandantes. Go to wishsidecollective.org to check out the other shows in the collective. As always, fuck shit damn. <laughs>